Hello and welcome back to FPV Reviews. Today we'll be discussing the single engine tractor configuration from a design and pilot's perspective for both general aviation aircraft as well as unmanned systems. We often think of single engine aircraft as normal, and it's true that they look simple, robust, and functional. After all, they've been around for over a hundred years and are generally accepted as a good configuration. When we look at the single engine airplane sitting on the ground or in the air, it looks balanced and symmetrical. There is, however, a not so obvious part of them that sabotages things from the very start and causes all sorts of problems from a standpoint of their flight dynamics and also with their aerodynamic efficiency. But how can they be that bad? After all, the engine is in line with the center of the aircraft and there's only one engine to fail so they're only half as likely to have an engine failure as a twin-engine aircraft. Well, the problem lies in two basic areas. One with the propeller itself, and two with the location of the propeller on the front of the aircraft. The propeller's job is to take rotational force and turn it into thrust. However, there are several side effects from doing so with a single propeller, and all of them create adverse effects. We'll be discussing them one by one. First up, and the most obvious, is torque. The propeller, just like a wing, makes lift and drag. The lift translates to thrust, and we have no complaints there. However, the drag translates into torque applied to the airframe. This aerodynamic torque effect will vary with engine RPM, and if the engine stops or is windmilling, leaving the prop stationary in flight, it's even reversed. This has the effect of torquing the whole airplane from one side to another with varying degrees of force depending on throttle setting and airspeed, requiring trim adjustments to the roll axis every time the airspeed changes or the throttle is adjusted. There's also a dynamic torque effect similar to the body roll applied to a car from simply revving the engine. The weight of the propeller resists changes in RPM, translating them to unwanted rolling force, although temporarily, imparted to the airframe when the engine RPM is changed abruptly. This can be enough to have catastrophic results for aircraft that are marginally stable during takeoff roll, have enough engine torque and propeller mass to be to their detriment usually on takeoff or during an aborted landing when power is applied suddenly. This effect can require trim as well in the roll axis at its very least, but at low speeds it is likely to require a sudden and massive control input from the pilot in order to prevent a disaster. If the throttles open suddenly on some aircraft types, no amount of control input is enough, and if you're at a low altitude the result might be a crash, and if you're at a higher altitude, it's actually used in aerobatic maneuvers to roll the entire aircraft over on its back. Next up is P-factor, aptly named for the cause, the propeller, yet again. This is also known as asymmetrical disc loading. This one requires just a little more thought to comprehend. Imagine looking at the airplane from the side. Visualize the airflow going into the prop arc at a perpendicular angle. In this case, we have a clean entry of the air into the prop and all is well. Now, increase the angle of attack of the aircraft, such as when the nose is tilted up during slow speed flight, or when the stick is pulled back in a high G turn at a higher airspeed. The airflow is now at a higher angle of attack on the prop blade than it is and on one side of the airplane and at a lower angle of attack on the prop blade on the opposite side. This causes the effect of offset thrust and it is the same as if the plane's engine were moved off of the center line sideways. The airplane will now pull to one side in the yaw axis while simultaneously pitching down to the differential drag loading due to the differential drag loading of the blades moving upward and downward on opposite sides of the center line. P factor will vary when performing maneuvers, changing air speeds, or even flying through turbulence. Trim will be required 
and the airplane will need to be retrimmed each time the airspeed is changed. It also contributes adversely to the torque roll problem by yawing the aircraft in the same direction as the roll, further hurting the pilot's chances of retaining control of the aircraft in such situations. Designers often compensate somewhat for P effect and torque effect by pointing the engine slightly to the right on most single engine aircraft by approximately two to three degrees. Slipstream effect is a close cousin to P effect. When the propeller accelerates the air past the fuselage and tail, it twists the air as well, and this rotational force is applied almost always unevenly to the airplane, resulting in unwanted yaw and roll forces which vary with the power setting and also require trim on both axes. Gyroscopic precession was a huge problem with many early aircraft where the entire engine was bolted solid to the propeller and turned with it. These engine types were called rotary engines for obvious reasons. With gyroscopic precession, the aircraft will rotate at a right angle to the direction that would intuitively result from the external torque. If that was confusing, imagine trying to remember exactly how it works and in which direction while flying the airplane. It matters too because it changes the way the airplane flies. Apply pitch or roll to an airplane with a rotary engine and you will get an effect on the other axis. For example, pitch up and the airplane may want to yaw left. Correct the yaw and there may be a resulting pitch change that will require compensation. That in turn will cause a yaw movement and so on and so forth. So we got rid of that problem like a hundred years ago and modern aircraft don't suffer from it, right? Well, mostly, but inherently wrong. Although we got rid of the spinning engine block, we still have a spinning propeller, which has the same effect, just on a smaller scale. With all of the other bad effects from a single engine aircraft propeller, we may not even notice this one, but rest assured, it's there. Okay, so if you thought, I'm glad we got that out of the way so we can talk about all the virtues of the single engine tractor configuration, you'd be wrong yet again, as there's one last inherent flaw we must discuss. That's form drag from the prop wash. The front of the airplane is a mighty handy place to put an engine and propeller from a structural standpoint, and it does simplify the design process, saving the manufacturer time and money. But being on the front of the fuselage, there are a lot of airplane parts that end up behind the propeller. Some of them have to be there, such as the engine or an electric motor. Usually a section of the wing ends up there as well. But there are lots of other parts of the airplane being hit by the accelerated air from the prop wash. The fuselage itself is right in the way. The windscreen, the landing gear struts, wing struts, any other protrusions such as bracing, foot pegs, and antennas. Finally, the tail is caught in this high-speed air. And all of those structures now present a significantly higher coefficient of drag than they otherwise would have if they were not located directly in the slipstream. This results in a loss of effective thrust from the propulsion system. Therefore, the engine and prop must be larger to compensate, and even more energy is lost. See the problem? Another factor is the turbulent air that is now flowing over all those structures. So they have to be built to withstand the resulting vibration and increased aerodynamic loads. Having all of this air blowing over the control surfaces when power is applied, only to lose it when the throttle is reduced, can cause a disconcerting feeling referred to as dead stick by pilots. And the same inconsistency makes it difficult to tune an autopilot properly for an unmanned air vehicle. Whereas bush pilots and stunt pilots have gotten used to giving a blast of throttle when they need a bit of extra response from the control surfaces on the tail, 
for autopilots, there's no code to quantify the effects in the software used, a fact often ignored by manufacturers of small unmanned aircraft and manned aircraft alike, resulting in less than desirable performance from the autopilot in terms of stability throughout the flight in varying conditions. The only solution to the autopilot tuning problem is to keep the control surfaces completely free from the prop wash, which is virtually impossible with a single engine tractor configuration. Let's talk for a moment about ground clearance. In order to achieve acceptable forward visibility for the pilot, most aircraft designers mount their engine low on the fuselage, reducing the propeller's ground clearance to an absolute minimum thus limiting prop size, therefore efficiency, of the propulsion system for slower aircraft, and either limiting the engine size that can be used for faster aircraft, or forcing the manufacturer to use a less efficient, multi-bladed propeller. Simply changing from a two-blade to a three-blade type will result in approximately 3-4% to 4 loss in propulsion system efficiency. Some single-engine aircraft have actually solved this problem by using a vertically split fuselage in front of the wing, but that has a cost and structural weight. At least it does solve the problem of ground clearance. Tail dragger aircraft improve a bit on this problem by, surprise, dragging the tail on the ground, thus raising the nose of the aircraft. Most bush pilots like to use extra-large tires as well, not only for the ability to roll over large obstacles, but also for the increased ground clearance they provide. Of course, flying around with giant bush tires out in the breeze does nothing to help efficiency, but it does look pretty cool. Last but not least, an engine failure means that the airplane is now a glider and probably not a very good one. While it's true that some twin-engine aircraft cannot maintain altitude well or climb with one engine out, at least you have more options when it comes time to select an emergency landing zone, and you can likely divert to a more ideal location, preferably one with a good restaurant. With modern multi-engine aircraft, you may be able to continue on to your destination depending on the density altitude, obstacles such as mountains in your path that you may need to clear along the way, and how loaded your aircraft is with passengers, cargo, or payload. Most reciprocating engines have dual ignition systems, which decreases the likelihood of an engine failure somewhat in the first place. And electric propulsion systems offer an even higher degree of reliability Due to, have, due to having fewer moving parts to fail. Also, they are much less likely to require maintenance, and when they eventually do need an overhaul, fewer parts are needing a replacement. So you might say, is there anything good you can say about the single-engine tractor configuration? Well, for some specialty applications, such as extreme stole competition, short takeoff or landing, and bush flying, the configuration does work well, although there have been some notable examples of divergence in this design which have proven to work very well, such as the de Havilland Twin Otter and the inline twin push-pull extreme short takeoff and landing aircraft known as the Double Ender prototype. At least with the single engine configuration, the air entering the prop is clean not turbulent, as in it is not passed over the fuselage or wing, such as in most pusher configurations before being ingested or sucked into the prop arc, creating noisy vibration and losses in efficiency. Guess I need to make a video about pushers now too. So why may you ask, do manufacturers continue to design airplanes with all of these bad characteristics? Why do pilots continue to purchase them? Well, for most applications, honestly, we've gotten used to mediocrity in design. It's also a practical matter, as a simple design helps to keep manufacturing costs low. 
many pilots are not very well educated as to all of the effects that are happening to their aircraft and simply learn to compensate for them without really thinking about why they happen. Nevertheless, we do see a strong trend toward multi-engine aircraft with the newest designs of manned and unmanned. There is also an emerging trend in future aircraft development toward distributed electric propulsion, using many smaller electric motors to power an aircraft, while doing much more to control the airflow over the wing in some cases and control surfaces, making possible greatly increased efficiency and bringing concepts like vertical takeoff and landing into the realm of practicality. The venerable single-engine configuration has essentially outlived its commercial purpose and is finally starting to be replaced with better solutions in most cases. With that in mind, the future of aviation safety and performance is looking bright indeed. Thanks for sticking with us through this video, and we're sorry if we've offended anyone for talking about single engine aircrafts, but we really thought it was necessary to talk about this. Be sure to hit that like button or dislike, depending of how you felt about this video. Um, keep in mind that our intention is good here. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel as we'll be talking in the future about uh, other different kinds of configurations, uh, their flight dynamics and performance characteristics. And if you can, hit that bell icon so you get notifications as well. So until next time, have a good one.